All right. Good evening. Thank you all for joining us. My name is David Jimenez. I'm part of the class of 2016. Me and Matt Liptrot are co-founders of the Eisenhower Forum, which is a new organization on campus committed to developing and introducing students to the best of conservative and center-right thought and public policy. Uh, we meet every Fridays uh, for dinner and discussion, and we've done topics ranging from Edmund Burke to the Second Amendment, climate change, and foreign policy. I'd like to thank many people who made this event possible, uh, Professor Alan Springer of the Government Department, who allowed us to access resources through the Lectures and Concerts Committee. Thanks very much for that help, along with the support from the Charles F. F. Adams Lectureship Fund. I'd also like to thank our advisor, Gene Yarbrough, who has been an amazing help for us over the past two semesters, along with Nate Hines, Clayton Rose, uh, SAFC, and the Student Activities Office. Thank you all so much for your help and very much excited for the future of the organization as we head into our second year. I'd like to introduce our speaker. Professor Adam Garfinkel is a co-founder and current editor of The American Interest, one of the nation's premier international affairs magazines, where he also contributes a regular column on the Middle East. In George W. Bush's administration, he served as a principal speechwriter for Secretaries of State Colin Powell and Condoleezza Rice. He has taught courses in foreign policy at a range of institutions, including John Hopkins, Haverford, and University of Pennsylvania. A widely published scholar and critically acclaimed author, he's received awards and grants from the US Department of State, the German Marshall Fund, the United States Institute of Peace, and Tel Aviv University. The topic of tonight's uh, discussion will be Obama in the Middle East, successes, failures, and lessons for the next president. As President Obama's final year draws to a conclusion, fierce debates about his foreign policy legacy will sharpen, particularly in regards to the Middle East. For the President's supporters, his administration has initiated the gradual reintegration of Iran into the international community and wisely rejected the interventionism of both his predecessor and the Washington foreign policy establishment. 
For his detractors, Obama's self-proclaimed realism is in fact a combination of both naivete and rigid ideological commitments, culminating in disastrous results in both Syria and Libya, along with the emergence of new destabilizing powers like the Islamic State, Iran, and a resurgent Russia. What are the truths and weaknesses behind these competing narratives? And what lessons might the Obama presidency hold for the next chief executive as he or she consider America's future role in the Middle East? Thank you, Professor Garfinkel, for joining us. Boy, those are really good questions, David. I wish I knew the answers to them. It's really good to be at Bowdoin. I've never been here before. I've been to Maine many times, but never to this campus, so I really had a great time looking around. I really like the, uh, the art museum. What a building. Yeah, over my here, I'll slide off. This is very difficult to, uh, to encompass Obama in the Middle East in a, in a short format because um, a lot's happened in the past seven and a half years. I don't know if you've noticed, but um, it's been like, for, for those of us who've been following or trying to follow this part of the world for, in my case, you know, 40 years and more, it's been a kind of accelerated experience. I mean, more stuff has happened in the past seven or eight years or decade than, than has happened, significant stuff, than seemed to have happened in the previous 30 years. So it's accelerated experience, very hard to, to unpack and to analyze. When it comes to the questions about the Obama administration in the Middle East, one of the difficulties um, any, any sort of normal, honest, objective observer has in, in coming to terms with uh, this, this not quite finished legacy is that there's so much vitriol and spleen spilling and partisanship in the discussion of these matters that it's very difficult to separate anything remotely like truth from um, uh, the hating that goes on. You know, there were the Bush haters back when, and now, the, now there are the Obama haters. And everything has become so partisan that all these arguments take on the appearance of an image in a funhouse mirror. So most of what you hear, a lot of what you hear anyway, you have to discount as being motivated by something other than an objective search for the truth. I myself do not hate anybody. Um, I served in uh, the Bush administration, as David mentioned, even though I'm not a Republican and never have been and never will be. Uh, I, can explain, I can explain how that happened if you're really curious about it, but. You know, Washington is kind of a mixed up place sometimes. As I tell people um, uh, who don't know much about the city, that Washington is the only, the only town I know where, where sound travels faster than light. But it really is a mixed up, muddled up, shook up kind of place, quote Ray Davies. And, and the and sort of, you know, black and white chocolate vanilla categories that you would, you would assume go on from the way that the press reads, it really is a, an oversimplification of reality. So it's possible, for example, to be not a neocon and to have been very skeptical about the uh, so-called uh, freedom agenda for the Middle East, you know, the Bush program of spreading democracy to 22 countries that uh, don't know what it is, uh, and still be skeptical of certain aspects of the nuclear deal with Iran. So some people don't understand how that can be. How could people who, how could people who you know, are, are a little worried about the terms of the Iran deal, why aren't, doesn't that make you a neocon? The answer is no. We don't have just chocolate and vanilla in Washington. We have strawberry and cherry and rum raisin, lots of flavors. Uh, and if you hang around the town long enough, you, you sort of eventually pick that up. Um, I'm not sure I even want to try to answer David's question. I mean, it's just really very simple. Let me just get that out of the way, okay? Uh, it's kind of a sport uh, among the chatterati in Washington to try to figure out what's going on inside a president's head or inside you know, the president and his closest advisors when they make portentous decisions. And there's a tendency among academics and among certain kinds of public intellectuals to create images of these things that, as Dean Acheson once said, are clearer than the truth. Now, when Acheson said that, he had something particular in mind. He meant that sometimes it was okay for a political speaker to round off reality so that people would be able to understand it and so that you could make a political point by, by getting people to understand it. When, I, when I'm talking now about rounding off, you know, uh, clearer than the truth, I mean, I mean trying to push a very complicated, messy decision process, which is what the government epitomizes, into neat little boxes that academics like. So for example, 
Um, one school of thought uh, among, I wouldn't say Obama haters, but Obama critics. One school of thought among the Obama critics uh, 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 hypothesizes as follows. This president uh, got his, his uh, basic upbringing, his, uh, his, 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 seminal, his seminal experience as an adult was the Vietnam War and the anti-war movement. He's intrinsically a leftist. He doesn't like American power. He's really an anti-establishment, adversary culture kind of guy. Okay, he's really been kind of hiding all this in order to do well in politics and get elected president. But really, he disparages American power. It makes him nervous. He doesn't believe in American exceptionalism as an answer to a question in London early in his term seemed to reveal to people. Um, and basically, his attitude is that uh, American foreign policy in the Middle East and in other parts of the world has been indistinguishable from colonialism and imperialism. And he therefore was, is attracted by uh, a, a theory of, of political or international relations and political science called offshore balancing. Now, what does this mean? America has only ever had two grand strategies in its history, as I, as I understand it. The first was from the time of the founding, from the time of the Constitutional Convention, 1789, until roughly the denouement of the Spanish-American War. And the policy can be, the grand strategy can be um, summed up very simply by saying, take North America, grab as much of North America as you can. And the United States did that. There were some detours along the way, a stupid war with Canada in 1812, a civil war, Mexican war, but we did it, we did it. And then uh, the, the, that grand strategy died of, died of success and we had to create a successor. The successor was created by a guy named Alfred Thayer Mahan, a navalist, uh, and I don't wanna spend too much time on this, but basically the theory was, given, given the changes in naval, naval technology and other technology, the grand strategy of the United States should be to prevent the emergence of a hegemon either in peninsular Europe or in East Asia. And the, and the reason for that was because we didn't want any, any power to accumulate such resources that they could put uh, America directly at risk, and also because a power trying to do that could threaten us enough that we would have to create and maintain a standing army. And a large standing army is something the founders didn't like. It, it rubs up against the Jeffersonian limited government liberal thesis that America, the American Constitution embodies. So how were we going to implement this strategy? Well, uh, from the time that Mahan created it until the time that it essentially failed in 1941, uh, we tried to implement the strategy by dint of uh, riding the coattails of the Royal Navy and self-help, bu building our own, our own power. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt sent the great white fleet around the world in 1905. We built the Panama Canal, was part of this whole business. Okay, so it didn't work out exactly the way we wanted to. We ended up in a war, the strategy essentially uh, it didn't fail, but it, but it collapsed into war. Then what happened? After the Second World War, we found ourselves with a lot of American troops at the brackets of Eurasia. And the strategy remained the same. Prevent hegemons from uh, growing in either peninsular Europe or in East Asia. During the war, the, na the, the hegemons had proper nouns. They were Imperial Japan and Nazi Germany. When the Cold War began, they acquired new proper nouns, and they were the Soviet Union and the People's Republic of China. The strategy was the same, prevent the hegemons, okay? How do we do that now? We don't do it by uh, uh, riding the coattails of the British Navy. We do it by forward deployment. We are there. We play in the regional politics of Europe and Asia by dint of our military force, mainly the Navy, and after that, the Air Force, and in doing so, uh, by creating a multilateral alliance in, in Europe called NATO and by creating a series of bilateral alliances in Asia with Japan, with South Korea, and so on. What we do is we, we enter into the security competition suppression business. We keep these areas. We, we, our military forces are anti to play in the geopolitics, but the purpose of it is to keep these places from going to war with each other because that creates a wedge into which the potential hegemon can, can take advantage. So we were in the security competition suppression business during the Cold War, and that worked out pretty well. All right, won the Cold War, we suppressed a lot of security competitions, okay. So this is, this is still the grand strategy of the United States because it hasn't been supplanted by anything else, but it's, it's still the grand strategy of the United States by, by kind, of, kind of amnesia. Because if you go down to Capitol Hill today and you ask a staff person, if you did that during the Cold War and you said, what's the grand, they would have told you the answer, they knew the answer. 
But after the end of the Cold War, and especially after 9-1-1, if you get on there today and you say, what's the grand... We're still doing this. Our military forces are structured along these lines. If you ask, if you ask a couple of key people, they know what this is, but nobody else seems to remember anymore what we're doing. Now, so the accusation is, is that Barack Obama is throwing over the forward-deployed tw twin anti-hegemon strategy that has been the grand strategy of the United States in two different forms since 1898. And he wants to go back to offshore balancing. And his view is, if only we would get our asses out of the way in various parts of the world, then other countries that have overlapping kindred uh, interests with our own will step up to the plate, and they will help to take care of their own regions, and we should just get out of the way. And these benign regional balances will arise if we, if we get out of the way. And the, and the logic of this ultimately is no more NATO, uh, no more bilateral treaties with Japan and so forth, because they, they threaten to chain gang us into wars with adversaries, Russia, China, that are really not vital interests of the United States. That's the thinking. Specifically with regard to the Middle East, all right, the Middle East only becomes a part of this strategy really uh, in a way uh, in the 1970s after the Cold War, but really starting with the Carter Doctrine in 1980. Uh, the, 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 um, the, the, the conjoining of the Middle East into the containment, we, call, we used to call it, we called it containment strategy after World War II, really takes place uh, only after the Iranian Revolution and the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan on Christmas Day, 1979. But the Middle East is seen, as, is seen instrumentally. In other words, the Middle East has no really, real intrinsic value except the oil, which is important for the international economy and the e economic vitality of, the, of the, uh, um, the allies and the alliances. But it's really... Um, because of the oil, it's instrumental, but it's not key. Uh, this distinction gets blurred over time, as distinctions like this tend to. And so it became essentially a vital area of, for the United States to, to defend. Now, after the Soviet Union goes away in 1991, 1992, we might have revisited a number of the assumptions that connected the Middle East to our grand strategy. But you know how governments are. They tend, they tend toward inertia. Um, unless somebody makes it rethink um, a, a working premise, it, it doesn't get rethought. Um, uh, unless, if you want to do anything new in government, something bold, you need to create a new bureaucratic chart because organizations, bureaucratic organizations, just do what they're designed to do. It's very hard to change them into doing something new. Very hard to do. In any event, the accusation about Obama is that he wants to scrap all this. A strategy that won the Cold War, that's worked very well, um, and he just wants to scrap it all for the idea of offshore balancing. And uh, the, the critique here is that offshore balancing doesn't really work. Uh, the model in the minds of the academics who propose this oftentimes is the concert of Europe. The idea that between the Treaty of, of Paris in 1814 and the onset of World War I, 1815, you had 100 years of where there, were, there was not a hegemonic war. And that was, it's, the concert of Europe is considered to be a great success. Of course, what they don't tell you, which you have to read actually the fine print of the history books to find out, is that there were plenty of wars during that period. They weren't, they weren't hegemonic wars, like the Napoleonic Wars, or like World War II was, but they were, there were plenty of wars. And that was a time when there weren't yet nuclear weapons or other forms of weapons of mass. So the idea here is that somehow these little wars, little wars, colonial wars, wars imperial wars, na wars of new nationalisms, these were the lubricants that allowed the system to, uh, to persist without a, a hegemonic war, collapsing to hegemonic war. And the, uh, the argument is Obama wants to go back to this, but we're in a new age now. And if we do that, we won't find benign balances uh, arising in various parts of the world. What we're going to find are a series of regional wars that are going to accumulate, and, and aggressions that are going to accumulate into um, a, basically a kind of a, a, a cascade of, uh, of instability, and it's going to cause panic in world leaders from one continent to another, and panic is an accident-prone condition to be in. And then they say, look, look at the world, look at Ukraine, look at Syria, look at the South China Sea, look what the North Koreans are doing thanks to their, the fact that they get energy and food from the Chinese. And you see, see, with the recession of American power, which the president supposedly wanted, the recession of American power does not create benign regional balances and does not sum into a benign international balance. Instead, you end up with what we see in the world today, which even Madeleine Albright called a great big mess. So this is supposed to be a, 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 text, a proof text of the fact that the president had the, all these ideas and that they turned out to be um, coherent but wrong. So that's, that's one argument. And in, in particular, 
in the Middle East again, the key to this offshore balancing strategy has been Iran. So the theory has been put forward that the president sees Iran as a partner of the United States to create a kind of strategic condominium in order to pacify and control the inherent violence and heterogeneity of the Middle East. Why? Because Iran is a nation state that controls its own territory, supposedly. Uh, the belief was that it, is, it has either changed, it has gone into Thermidor from the period of the Iranian Revolution, or will soon do so. Tremendous pressures in Iran against the regime. Uh, the people want normalization. The, most Iranians don't like their regime. They're very pro-American once you get down into the street. All that's true, by the way. And so the idea was, we will partner with Iran, and, uh, and that will pacify the Middle East. So this, is a, this reminds you a little bit of the Nixon Doctrine, for those of you who have either read about this in books or who are old enough to remember it, that in the denouement of the Vietnam War, which was not fun, uh, basically the Nixon administration proposed a, a series of regional pillars theory. Uh, uh, we were going to retrench uh, the exercise of our direct power, and we were going to rely on strong allies in various parts of the world to carry the burden, bur burden sharing. And again, Iran was one of the pillars. The Shah of Iran was one of the pillars of the Nixon Doctrine. And every time we recede from a war, uh, we go into a kind of a, a, a kind of a hutch down a little bit. Oh, it's inevitable that we come up with these theories of sharing, sharing authority, uh, sharing power, sharing responsibility with other major regional partners. So in this, in the current iteration, uh, in Asia, it's Japan and India. And, so, and, and in, uh, in Europe, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a new, strong, and self-confident Poland, or at least it was until a couple of months ago, um, in democratic Poland until a couple of months ago. And in the Middle East, it was Iran. So here's, here's the argument. The argument is that uh, the, the nuclear deal with Iran, uh, the president says uh, that it was designed to stop the Iranians who were rushing pell-mell toward a breakout capacity in nuclear weapons. And that's true. That's true. Um, and the president understands that uh, if there were an Iranian breakout, it would set off a mousetrap proliferation race all over the Middle East. You'd end up not with one or two countries in the region, or three with nuclear weapons. You might end up with five or six or seven. And if that were the case, then inevitably there would be a nuclear war out of accident or miscalculation. It would be a, ca a catastrophe for us and for, of course, the people who live there. Uh, that's true, too, and the president understood that. He didn't, try to, he didn't try to wish away the problem by saying that the deterrent structure of the Cold War could be superimposed on the Middle East. He's smart enough to know that that's not, that's not, that's, that's stupid, can't do that. Um, but the idea was, really, uh, if that's the case, uh, then this argument goes, uh, we were going to get in bed with the Iranians. We were going to try to make up, make, we were going to try to not just normalize, but create an entente, essentially, with the Iranians. And that was going to solve our problems in, in the region. Uh, and, uh, the, the further argument is that we went about it, and so the president said that, that, that no deal is better than a bad deal. But given the strategic um, mindset, what he really meant was, but he couldn't say, is that any deal is better than no deal. Because the deal was not just designed to prevent an Iranian nuclear breakout, it was also designed to reformulate U.S. relations with Iran for a grander strategic purpose. A little like the Nixon um, trip to China and the attempt to uh, basically suborn China and to using it, using it into uh, an ally of the United States against the Soviet Union uh, after 1969 in, in the latter stage of the Cold War. Is any of this true? Is any of this true? Um, if you read the uh, interview, the president, the series of interviews that Jacob Goldberg cobbled together into the so-called Obama Doctrine piece in the Atlantic, the cover story of this month's Atlantic. If you haven't read that, you really should, because it's, it's really quite an amazing article. Never in my lifetime, I don't think ever, period, has any sitting president laid bare his thinking uh, to such an extensive and explicit degree as President Obama did with Jacob Goldberg. And a couple of years before, he did a very similar thing with respect to domestic politics, a 17,000-word you know, heart-to-heart, on-the-couch essay that David Remnick created uh, in January of 2000 for The New Yorker. If you take these two, and that was mostly about domestic policy, but also something, some about foreign policy. If you take the Remnick piece from January 2014 and the Goldberg piece from April, from this month uh, in The Atlantic, you get, a, you get a portrait of a president's mind like none we have ever had, certainly in my lifetime. It's really quite remarkable. And, and, wh and what do we learn from these portraits? We learn that this, 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 again, I won't call it exactly an Obama-hater thesis. 
We and and, it's, and some people even went farther than that. Some people argue that Obama, because he hates American power, or he thinks that American power is ipso facto imperialism, that he's actually planned and plotted and desires American decline. Not decline at home, of course, but decline in terms of, it, of, of being a world power. That this is what the president wanted. He, wanted. he wants the decline of the United States and the world. When you read the, uh, the Remnick and the Goldberg pieces, uh, and assuming that the president hasn't made all this up, assuming that it's, this is not total eyewash, and I, don't, I just don't believe that it could be. I mean, the, it, the language doesn't suggest that this is one enormous deception. A lot of people go in for conspiracy theories, but um, we shouldn't. <laughs> If you read this stuff carefully, you see that that's not at all what the president thinks. He, he doesn't disparage American power. He doesn't even go in for offshore balancing. Uh, he doesn't, uh, he never believed that if the United States simply receded from uh, its, its, uh, the insertion of its power in various regions of the world, that, that ipso facto benign balances would emerge in these regions and that everything would be great without us. Uh, there's no, there's no evidence in any of these, in any of these materials uh, that that's true. Uh, I asked you know, former colleagues of mine, uh, refugees from the National Security Council, for example. The, the NSC tends to burn people out, the, the, the schedule that you have, to, you have to maintain to work at the White House. So I asked them, I said, look, you've got these people out here propounding these, these grand theories of what Obama's grand strategy is. I mean, tell me, does, is this man a systematic strategic thinker? Does he really connect ends and means in an extremely careful and deliberate way, uh, the way that s several American Cold War presidents did and had to because of the nature of the Cold War uh, challenge? Or is this a kind of, a, a kind of an instinctual ad hocery? You know, that the man has certain, certain gut feelings, certain gut, gut sense, a sense, gut sense of what is, what is smart and what is not smart. Uh, but that he doesn't have, you know, a coherent programmatic grand strategy where everything is tightly laced. And really what you have is the crisis, the crisis du jour. You have um, stuff that happens in the world and it's supposed to get solved at the lowest possible level of the bureaucracy. And only the really hard things end up in the Oval Office. And when they do, the president's gotta make a decision. He's gotta do something, right? And so what you end up is, what you end up with is a collision between these gut instincts that every president brings to office uh, with him on the one hand, and these, these surprises, these nasty surprises, and generally speaking in, in government, uh, uh, in all levels, the, the urgent drives out the important. So what is, what is, I ask these people, what does this administration look like from the inside? Is it crisis management, or is it this, is it this, this very ornate, careful, systematic, programmatic grand strategy? And to a man and a woman, they all answered, it's the former. The president is not He's interested mostly in domestic issues. He's interested in what he calls nation building at home. He's interested in issues of distributive, redistributive justice and all these things that we know from all the last seven and a half years. Uh, he cares about foreign policy, he has to. He cares about the security of the United States. It's his job, he's commander in chief. But he's not a systematic thinker about foreign policy. So you, you have something a, a little less, put it that way, than the right angled theories of academics and public intellectuals who like to tie every, everything up in nice, neat knots. So, you know, I think the president in the Middle East has made, a, the administration, it's not all the president, has made a series of, of you know, a series of mistakes. Uh, and I, I just list them very, very briefly. Uh, there seems to be some kind of a disease in Washington that afflicts secretaries of state and occasionally presidents, a disease that, um, that uh, invades their minds and tells them that they have to solve the Israeli-Arab conflict. And they have to solve the Israeli-Palestinian dimension of the conflict. And the first thing that a lot of administrations do is they try to go at the very hardest nut that there is to crack, not just in the region, but probably on the planet, okay? Uh, and they somehow persuade themselves that whereas all of their predecessors have made only incremental progress at best, so they think, they somehow have, you know, the magic, the magic formula and they're gonna solve the problem. So the, the, the and as with its predecessors, the Obama administration started out, you know, landing on all, all four paws uh, with the so-called peace process and screwed it up royally. Uh, I won't go into detail about the, the serial diplomatic malpractice that the administration um, uh, got itself messed up into, but its record 
in terms of just getting the protagonists together even to talk, let alone to agree on anything, is the worst of any administration since that of Lyndon Johnson. And this is not a coincidence. Not that the, not that the core of the conflict was amenable to solution anyway. It was overdetermined that things were not set up right, the planets were not aligned, but the administration did a lot of silly things, like, for example, uh, calling for a complete settlement freeze, including a settlement freeze uh, appertaining to East Jerusalem. Uh, the Palestinians had never even demanded that. All right? And there had been incremental progress uh, before, and the Palestinians had never even demanded that. So when the Americans demanded it, the Palestinians had no choice but to demand it too. And it pushed Mahmoud Abbas up a pole from which he could not get down again. So there were a series of things like that that just weren't very smart. But we won't talk more about the Arab-Israeli business because it gives me a headache. It also causes a lot of stress, and my doctor told me to avoid gratuitous stress. So I no longer follow the Arab-Israeli uh, conflict carefully because it's bad for my health. Other mistakes. Well, my God, uh, people, of course, have different views on this. And as I say, I'm not an Obama hater. But the president himself revealed in the interview and elsewhere that he is, he is regretful over the way that Libya happened. Um, I could tell you lots of stories about this whole Libya caper stuff, but I wrote on it at the time. And the, the, the article that I wrote, once the cruise missiles hit Tripoli, American cruise missiles started the war, hit Tripoli in March 2011, I had just gotten off a Navy ship called the USS Boxer, which is a helicopter landing deck ship. It's basically a marine ferry. And I was on the ship because I was a so-called SME, a SME. You know, Washington is the wonderful world of acronymphomania, you know. You have to like the acronym. SME it means a subject matter expert. And there's a program in the Navy where um, subject matter experts uh, accompany a, a, a naval deployment on the first leg of a deployment to just tell the officers where they're going. Not, not physically, but politically and historically. Where are you going? You should know these things. So I just got off the boat, you know, when all this stuff was going, when this stuff was going on, and the officers asked me, you know, are we gonna, be, are we gonna see action uh, with respect to Libya? And I said, I certainly hope not, because there are no vital interests involved in Libya, and if we break that, that crystalline shell of an of a, of a, of a extremely fragile regime, we're going to destroy the Libyan state. And if we do that, bad guys, including Al-Qaeda-type guys, are going to pick up the pieces. We're going to create a failed state. And if we create a failed state in Libya, we're going to cause the, a certain, peop, certain portion of the population, the Tuareg, to go wild, which they did, of course, and caused a war in Mali. And we're going to create a funnel for immigration into the heart of southern Europe. And I predicted all these things, and I, I wasn't alone. Secretary Gates was against this intervention. Every member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff was against this intervention. The president did it anyway. And whereas the president and other people in the administration complained bitterly about the Bush administration's failure to enact phase four in Iraq. In other words, what happens when the fighting stops? What, what, what are you going to do with the place once you've, once, you've, once you've kicked out the bad guys? And the Bush administration totally screwed up phase four in Iraq. So here come the Obama administration, they do the same thing in Libya. There is no phase four. So the president said he thought the British and the French and the Europeans were gonna do this and we wouldn't have to be, to be bothered with it. And anybody who believes a promise from the, from the French government deserves everything that happens to him, as far as I can see. But that was a disaster and it remains a disaster. And of course, Hillary is implicated in the disaster. And here's what's so, what's, what's so annoying about Washington. Again, sound traveling faster than light. So what have the Republicans been on for the last three years about Libya? They've been on Ambassador Stevens and the attack in Benghazi a year after, you know, uh, um, a year, uh, year, year, year gone, gone after. Okay, to me, that's just a political witch hunt. I'm not wild about Hillary Clinton, personally. I'm a lot less wild about Mr. Cruz and Mr. Trump, but that's neither here nor there. I'm not a Democrat, I'm not a Republican, I'm a Whig, okay? My four heroes of American history are Alexander Hamilton, Henry Clay, Abraham Lincoln, and Theodore Roosevelt, and it stops right there. So I'm a Whig, so I don't care about the politics of it because I'm still living in the 19th century politically. Anyway, so this was a complete mess, but why should the Republicans be harping on what happened in 2012 in Benghazi? The, 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 the mistake, if, if Hillary made a mistake, and Susan Rice and the others, and Samantha Power, they made a mistake, it wasn't in 2012, it was the decision to go to war in the first place. The president was very reluctant. The president laid down conditions. I want an Arab League imp imprimatur. I want a UN Security Council resolution. I want and I want and I want, you know? All the things that he thought he wouldn't get and therefore wouldn't have to do anything. And lo and behold, he turns around and, and the Cotteries, 
damn cotteries. They, they, they supply the Arab side. So the, the, the man's boxed in. He has no choice. He's boxed himself in, and then he regrets it. You, re, you should read what he says about Libya in the, Gold, in the Goldberg piece. It's really precious. So that was a mistake. Then Iraq. Okay, here we have a yo-yo situation. We have the Bush administration um, uh, making all kinds of mistakes in Iraq. Whether the initial decision to depose Saddam Hussein was a mistake or not, you can argue until we can go around the block. We can go around the block on this one so many times that the, the, that the edges of the block will be worn away. So we're not going to do that. But certainly, uh, uh, the, the, the Bush decision to, you know, to smash Iraq created a vacuum that allowed uh, 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 Musa al-Zarqawi, al you know, al-Qaeda in Iraq, and then later ISIS, uh, to gain a foothold, and then the president's decision to remove all the troops from Iraq a little sooner than might have been prudent, because he couldn't get a SOFA agreement, status of forces agreement. Probably a mistake. I think most people think that, retrospectively, that was a mistake. So the excesses of the Bush administration and the opposite of the excesses of the Obama administration together created the conditions, then the Syrian civil war, for the rise of Daesh or ISIS. So that's not any one administration's fault, that's two administrations' fault, plus other extraneous developments that neither one uh, anticipated. But that probably was a mistake. Now, Syria. Syria is awfully difficult to parse. Syria is a very hard problem. It was a hard problem from the beginning. It was going to be a hard problem even if Mitt Romney had become president. It was just a hard problem. But what everybody at the time who knows about the region suggested to the president, including many of his own advisors, and this is all out there in public, is that, yeah, it's hard. But if we do, don't try to use American force, American power, not force, judiciously early on in this mess, okay, maybe in conjunction with the Turks, maybe with NATO imprimatur, uh, sort of having the back of the Turks and the United States, if we don't do something to smother the violence, two things are going to happen. Well, three things are going to happen. One, all of Syrian politics are going to become militarized. Three, three, one, three, boy, oh, boy. Two, <laughs> the opposition is going to become Islamicized. And three, it's going to spread. There's going to be a refugee mess in Turkey, in Jordan, in Lebanon, elsewhere. It's going to metathesize. It's going to, it's going to infect the entire region. So yeah, it's hard. And yeah, the prospects of heading it off are not great. But the costs of inaction are likely to be even greater. All right, the president overlearned the lessons of the Iraq war. Fine, one can understand that. Then came Libya. And his regrets over Libya reinforced what he understood about the Iraq war. And that explains, to a large extent, the relative passivity of the United States in Syria. And now look what we have. Ambassador Ford, uh, our ambassador to Syria, and many other people who understand the region, we all predicted these things. Everybody who understands the region, we all predicted these things. And guess what? They happened. Ta -da. That's what a PhD will do for you, you know? You can predict things. Anyhow. A very hard problem, but probably, probably a mistake. One could go on. Um, again, I, I mentioned the Iran deal. Well, you know, you know what, uh, I forget who it was. Was it, was it, was it, uh, it was either Charles de Gaulle or John Foster. You know, I get, I'm to the age right now. I forget names. I'm past 60, you know, I'm, I forget names. But child, either it was either, either John Foster Dulles, I think it was John Foster, or de Gaulle, who asked Joe and Lai what he thought about the French Revolution. And Joe and Lai's answer was, it's too soon to tell. OK, well, I would say the same thing about the Obama record. And maybe the president is right. Maybe, maybe there are no vital interests of the United States in the Levant. Maybe it doesn't matter if the Russians go in there and save the Assad regime. Assad is the premier mass murderer of our, of our uh, time. Yeah, at least 250,000 people killed, mostly innocent civilians, mostly Sunnis. Some people put the number up closer to 400,000 people. That's a lot of people. Five million refugees. You know, it's horrifying, really horrifying. Um, but maybe he's right that, that, you know, in his brand of realism, that's not a vital interest of the United States. Nothing that happens in this part of the world after the Cold War, uh, where there is no longer one seamless conflict, one seamless struggle with a, with, a, with a single adversary, nothing that happens in that part of the world can really matter. What matters is Asia. What matters is whatever he thinks, whatever, what matters is preventing another mass casualty terror attack on the United States. That's why the drones in Waziristan and Yemen and so on. Maybe he's right. Maybe his ratcheting down of, what, of how an American vital interest is defined is right and long overdue. Maybe that's correct. Uh, we haven't done a zero-based reanalysis of our sense of vital interest since the end of the Cold War. And that is an indictment of the foreign policy establishment. It really is. But we don't know yet. Um, 
things are, things are, as Madeleine Albright said, things are a real mess right now. Uh, how this all comes out in the wash, we're going to have to wait and see. Um, did I miss anything? Oh, yeah, we made, we made, we've made smaller mistakes. So, for example, the Saudis, not exactly the best ally the United States has ever had, but, you know, uh, better than any, any available alternative in that circumstance right now, regrettably. That's how, that's how the world is, you know. The, the choices are very rarely between good and evil, but they're between, you know, secondary and tertiary grades of evil or, or difficult things to have to decide. That's just the way things are built. Um, but uh, we didn't, one of the, the way that the administration went about the Iran deal was by delinking the negotiations with everything else the Iranians were doing in the region, including in Syria. And clearly one of the reasons why the president was reluctant to intervene in Syria was because he didn't want to queer the Iran negotiations, all right? But um, we did it in such a way that every single ally we've had for a long time, you know, the Saudis, the Kuwaitis, the Jordanians, the Israelis, the Emiratis, all of these guys have laundry problems now because of the way that they think Obama has cut them loose to face, to face ISIS on the one side, to face the Iranians and the Shia, uh, including now Baghdad, on the other. Um, King, the late King Abdullah's famous statement was uh, uh, that we have to cut off the head of the snake, referring to Iran, right? Well, they don't think that we want to cut off the head of the snake. They think that we want to have tea with the snake. They think that we want to cuddle with the snake. They think that we want to go to bed with the snake. So we have a difference of opinion. And as a result of souring the relationship with Saudi Arabia over Iran, when the Saudis, in their almost infinite encyclopedic stupidity, decided to start a war in Yemen, we decided to be complicit in it, and we decided to support them, just because they were, they, we were trying to make nice with them. So they bombed Sana'a and killed all these civilians, and we're complicit in it. That's another mistake. That's a bad mistake, because that's a mistake that could reopen a war that, uh, that finished in 1934 over the province of Asir, which used to be part of Yemen, but which has since been part of Saudi Arabia, and Lord knows where this will lead. And if we are complicit in it, it would not be good. But that's, looks like, it looks to me like that's very likely uh, to happen. There are so many other things to talk about. I mean, we can talk about the Kurds. We haven't mentioned the Kurds. That's the single most important development in the Middle East in recent years, the rise of Kurdish nationalism, and that, how that's going to affect Iran and Syria and Turkey and, and, and Iraq. We, we haven't even, that, that, we could be here until Friday talking about that. That's so complicated. We're not gonna do that. Um, we didn't even talk about Egypt. The administration is, now here, the haters, the haters have accused the administration of, oh, so loathsome, terrible things that we did in Egypt. What were these loath loathsome things that, um, that the administration, the Obama administration, did in Egypt? Well, there were two, really, and they were connected. The first accusation was that we threw Hosni Mubarak over the side. We betrayed Hosni Mubarak. This is the Saudi line to this day. Uh, I shouldn't use a bad language word, should I? Let's just say that um, it's not true. What happened, in, what happened in Cairo was that the generals, uh, especially Field Marshal Tantawi and his friends, they believed that uh, Mubarak was old and sick and, and, and slightly senile, and that he was past his sell-by date, and they threw him over the side. Once the Egyptian generals threw Mubarak over the side, and they were, they were irritated about a couple of things, okay? It looked like Mubarak, and especially his wife Suzanne, were promoting their son, Gamal, to be the successor. And Gamal has a, an MBA from an American university. And he and some, and some of his US MBA cronies were trying to reform the Egyptian economy. And they actually succeeded. If you go back and you, you look up the growth rates of the Egyptian economy in the last four or five years of the Mubarak regime, they're pretty impressive, okay? Uh, they reformed the, uh, the, command, the command control you know, uh, economy run by the military bureaucracy, did a pretty good job. Also in the process of, of, uh, of deregulating or taking away a lot of the military's you know, iron rice bowls, they created a lot of corruption. But that's, that's a byproduct of that kind of, that kind of um, reform in Egypt. It created a lot, but the, the, military, the military is in, insinuated in every aspect of the Egyptian economy that makes money. They, they, they euphemistically refer to this, this behavior as their pension fund. They were very upset that um, Mubarak's son, Mubarak and Suzanne Kidd, Gamal, would basically ruin their, their gig. And so that was, that was one of the reasons for throwing, throwing over um, Mubarak, so that Gamal wouldn't take over when the old man left the scene, right? So the idea that somehow we threw uh, Hosni Mubarak over the side is just baloney. That's, a, that's not a bad word, is it? It begins with a B, but it's not the word that I would usually use. Anyway, it's baloney, not true. Then, fast on, uh, in a little while, um, 
uh, Mohammed Morsi of the Muslim Brothers of Ikhwan al Muslimin gets elected, kind of elected, president of Egypt. And the haters or the critics of Obama say, you see, these guys really like the Muslim Brotherhood. They don't understand the true nature of the Muslim Brotherhood. They think the Muslim Brotherhood is a bridge to pluralist politics in Egypt and ultimately an Egyptian democracy. But they're crazy. They don't understand that, that the Brotherhood is essentially a Leninist vanguard organization. There's not a democratic bone in their body, not even in their, in their ear, the little bones in the ear. And this is a cat catastrophic. Now, it's true that Ambassador Patterson, Ann Patterson in Cairo, said some things about the, uh, about the Morsi government and about the Brotherhood that I wish she hadn't said. And I've told, I've told Ambassador Patterson that I think she probably should have not said those things. Though I know her from a long time ago, the way that she said them. But, you know, so what? So what? But none of that's true. There's no love affair with the Muslim Brotherhood and the Obama administration. It doesn't prove that Barack Hussein Obama is a closet secret Muslim. This is also a, the B word. Uh, you can call it baloney, you know. It's just ridiculous. Basically, anybody who's been in the government knows what went on. Okay, we have a lot of equities in Egypt. Uh, we care about the canal. We care about the peace treaty with, with Israel. We care about Egyptian cooperation and counterterrorism. We have a lot to do with the Egyptians. Uh, and we were going to have to keep doing those things. And we, we spent a lot of money on Egypt since Camp David, you know, about $2 billion a year. Pretty soon that adds up into grocery money, you know what I mean? So we have a lot of investment in Egypt and a lot of equities in Egypt. And we're going to have to deal with who's ever running the government the next morning. It isn't like we could throw the Egyptian election. It isn't like we wanted to throw the Egyptian election. So what do you do as a diplomat? You lay the groundwork for saving whatever equities you can and dealing with the devil himself if you have to, if that's who the Egyptians elect, okay? You do what you need to do. That's how, that's how things work in real life, as opposed to in you know, the, the, uh, the, uh, the ideological uh, newspaper columns. So that's what happened. Uh, there, was, this was no, there was no secret plot here to, to bring the Muslim Brotherhood to, to power in one Arab country after, and it's a bunch of baloney, okay? So that wasn't a mistake. That's a, that's a um, series of behaviors that are, that are often characterized as a big mistake, but it wasn't a mistake at all. It was a lot of unfortunate stuff happened, but we didn't do it. You know, the United States can't, can't wave its little finger and have everything work out in the world the way we want. That would be nice. Well, maybe it wouldn't be nice, because sometimes we don't want the right things. But, you know, we're not as powerful, we're not, we're not as evil as uh, the, 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 the detractors of the United States think, and we're not as powerful as just about anybody thinks. And if you don't believe me, join the federal government, you'll find out what we can't do. Um, one, let me just check the time here. Hmm, pretty awful. I better, I better close. <clears throat> let, me, let me just close uh, with something a little different here. So, like, what are the, so what are the lessons for the next administration? God, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> from this mishmash, all right? Look, first of all, every foreign policy is a collision of three, of three factors. There is an inheritance, right? You inherit the policy of your predecessor, and you in inherit the circumstances that your predecessor gave you, whether you like them or not. You also inherit the reality in the region to which those policies apply. That comes with the territory. There's nothing you can do about that. You can't, there's no tabula rasa. You can't start over, all right? The second piece of the collision is, again, the gut instincts, uh, the lessons that a pr from, from life that a president and his closest advisors bring into that office. And the third is what I would just call surprise. You know, as they say, um, well, the, the, the geologists put it this way, shift happens. <laughs> All right, surprises, you know, the crisis du jour, dealing with, dealing with the fire of the day. You know, the, the, that, that's what foreign policy is made up of, these three ingredients, all foreign policy, not just in the Middle East, not just in this administration, that's what, that's what it is, okay? So since that will be different in the next administration, since the inheritance from this administration to the next won't be the one, the same as the one that uh, Obama got from Bush, and since the man's instincts or woman's instincts are gonna be a little bit different, uh, in, in the case of uh, certain Republicans get elected, they're gonna be a lot different, not necessarily better, and then who knows what surprises are in store? I mean, we don't know that. If we knew that, boy, we would really be rich. We could make a lot of money predicting stuff that nobody, nobody knows is going to happen. So I don't know that there are any lessons. There are some general lessons, certainly. Um, one is to expect the unexpected. That's pretty trite, isn't it? But it's true. I mean, you know, um, there's, an old, there's an old proverb that, you know, man plans and God laughs. 
It sounds better in German, but never mind. But that's true. So, people, so humility is useful, and hubris is your worst enemy. Hubris is always your worst enemy in a job like that. I could tell you some stories about Mitt Romney. I, work, I, work, I did a little work with Mitt Romney, who um, not the most second time he ran for president, but the first time. And again, I'm not a Republican, but you know, he asked me, so what the heck? He's, you know, he's, uh, and I could tell you stories about him, but I won't because um, they're not nice. But anyway, hubris is bad. You know, being sure that you're right without having a really good experiential reason to, th to be right, that's very dangerous. I'd rather have somebody, I'd rather have a kind of a, an agnostic opportunist, someone like Fr Franklin Roosevelt, who rose to the occasion of the Second World War, right? Rather than, ha rather than have any, any kind of a dogmatist or ideologue of either flavor, main flavor, uh, as president of the United States, because it's the ideology that, that, that incubates the hubris, and it's the hubris that gets us in trouble. So I'll just say one more thing. Can I say one more thing? Okay. I talked a little bit about the inheritance, the inheritance of the policy, but I want to talk for just a minute or two about the inheritance of the region itself, because there's a lot of misunderstanding out there about what's going on in the region, and a lot of it is the fault of um, well-meaning but undereducated journalists and other various and sundry chatterati who just don't know what they're talking about. So one thing that you hear a lot if you read, if you read the press and you read the literature, you, I mean, I, I wish I had a nickel for every time I've read this lately, is that what you're seeing in the Middle East, and this was uh, um, uh, said a lot in the wake of the so-called but very misnamed Arab Spring. Uh, oh, but there were mistakes there too, but I didn't have time to, I mean, I had a list here. See how it's big, my big list, <clears throat> which I hardly even looked at. Okay, so what's really going on? So what's, what, what you see all the time is that the so-called Sykes-Picot system is collapsing. Now, um, I'm kind of assuming that at, at Bowdoin College, I don't have to, I don't have to de define or describe or spell out what Sykes-Picot refers to. It's a little nugget of language that refers to uh, an agreement between Britain and France in April 1916 Wow, 1916, this is 2000, um, that 90 years ago? No, it's 100 years ago. <laughs> I, math was never my thing. And by the way, speaking of you know, being 60, right? Uh, I, I, my, my, my old friend Kinky Friedman used to say as follows, and I'm, I can definitely say this now, right? That, that I'm too young for Medicare, but I'm too old for women to care. It's a very confusing time for, for men of my age, so please forgive me if I can't remember names. Sykes-Picot, 1916, 100 years ago, got the math right this time. So people say that this means that, that what you're seeing in the Middle East, the Arab Spring, the Sykes-Picot system is falling apart. This is twice wrong, twice wrong. First of all, it's wrong historically because there were five secret agreements during World War I between the Allies, and Sykes-Picot was not the most important one. So it did not define the borders of the modern Middle East. Uh, if you know anything about how the borders of the modern Middle East were really formed, and you say a thing like that, there could only be two possible reasons for it. One, you're just using it as shorthand to get on with your argument, or two, you have no idea what you're talking about. The other reason that, that it's wrong is a more important reason. The, the, the inter-Arab system created after World War I, when the, when the Arab territories of the Ottoman Empire were divided up into mandates between Britain and France, it's not the international relations subsystem that's falling apart. It's the units themselves. It's the state, artificial state units themselves that are decaying, that are, that are deinstitutionalizing. Why is this? When the British and the French imposed the mandates, and then ultimately the mandates became independent states, gradually in the case of some countries, less gradually in the case of others, they were fitted with a Westphalian unit a territorial state that had no precursors at all in the history or, or the institutional life of these peoples, of these societies. These were, again, from a cultural anthropology point of view, these were tribal societies, segmentary lineages. They didn't understand the meaning of a line on a map that separated a state. They didn't under, all of these institutions that were Western, that came out of the Reformation, that came out of the Renaissance, these were experiences that were totally foreign to the Arabs and to the Middle East. So you had a situation where there was a huge gap between the normal social attitudes of these people and these societies on the one hand and the institutions with which they were saddled on the other, and it never made for a very good fit. These states never cohered as strong states. They did to some extent in a few places where there was a long pre-Islamic state history, Egypt for one, Yemen, Morocco, but in most of these places, um, uh, the, 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 the idea, the Western idea of the territorial Westphalian state 
lived in great awkwardness with the the raw materials of, that, of those societies, cultures, and history. Now, they were artificially propped up for a long time by m mostly military governments in these parts of the world, especially in the more heterogeneous societies. Uh, then later, they were propped up by the exigencies of the Cold War, where the Russians on the one side and the Americans on the other propped up various clients in relation to the other. But when the Cold War ended, and these societies found themselves unable to provide basic, basic state services, education, housing, sanitation, uh, the gap between the facade of the institutions on the one hand and the actual so sources of social authority in the, in the cultures on the other hand got wider and wider and wider until these places simply began to turn into dust. Now, four Arab countries no longer, well, the countries exist, but the states no longer exist. As we grow, grew used to them in the post-war period, there's no more Libya, and I doubt that it can be reconstituted in its old territorial form. There's no more Iraq and I doubt that it can be reconstituted in its old territorial form. There's no more Syria, and I doubt that it can be reconstituted in its old form. And there's Yemen I'm not sure about. The Yemen, Yemen's have come together and fallen apart, come together again a few times. I don't know what's going to happen in Yemen. But there could be others. Could be Saudi Arabia, could be Jordan. This is not over. So in other words, what we're seeing here is not a superficial international relations or, you know, or, um, uh, uh, interstate phenomenon. What we're seeing here is a phenomenon very deep in the societies of these countries. And what that means is that this is going to go, and, and of course it's, it's compounded by a religious sectarian conflict. It's, it's compounded by uh, ethnic differences between Turks and Kurds and Arabs and, Pers and, and Iranian Persians and so forth, and Azeris. And, and it looks to me like this is going to go on for quite a while. And by quite a while, I mean 20 years, 30 years. There's no quick solution to this, and there's very little that outsiders by themselves can do about this, even a very important power, strong power like the United States. We can't fix this. President Obama is right about that. It doesn't mean there's nothing we can do. There are some things we can do and ought to do to limit, limit the damage, to contain it, and to start the gardening phase for a better future. But we can't just go in with an army and solve it. So, so some people say, we, we should just send the special forces, the, the Navy SEALs and a bunch of really, you know, sharp, sharp Americans. Just let them take Raqqa, you know, the so-called capital of Daesh, of the Islamic State. And, uh, and uh, we should help the Iraqi army take Mosul back from, from Daesh. Okay, great. That sounds like it's a great applause line, right? And there's a danger of not taking them because they spawn terrorist attacks. Most recently in Brussels, France, we know, okay, okay. But I refer to this as the dog chases school bus problem. Uh, in other words, dogs like to chase school buses. We all know that, at least around my neighborhood they do. And occasionally, if the bus has to stop at a red light, the dog can actually catch the school bus. The dog can sink his tires into the left, into the, his teeth into the left rear tire of the school bus, right? Then the dog has a problem. What's he gonna do with the school bus, right? Same thing, well, we can go in and take Raqqa, we can go and take Mosul too, but then we're like a dog with a school bus in our teeth. What are we gonna do with the damn thing? Who's gonna govern it, right? Raqqa is a Sunni town. Uh, do you think that they're going to let Alois from Damascus come and govern them again? Uh-uh. Mosul is a Sunni town. Are they going to let a Shia army and a Shia government in Baghdad come and rule them hundreds and hundreds of miles away? No. So unless you have a solution for what you do after the dog catches the tire, you know, and the catches the school bus, you don't have a strategy. So I'm going to say this is very hard. And this is going to be on the plate of the next president and probably the president after that. This is a long-term problem. Last, last word. If you want to know what this part of the world kind of looks like, there's an historical analogy for, there's an historical analogy for almost everything. For example, Daesh, when, Daesh, when ISIS popped out of, the, you know, out, of the, out of nowhere in June of 2014, I said to myself, oh my God, it's the second coming of the Almohads. You're not, you're, not, you're not allowed to say that in Washington because no one's ever heard of the Almohads, and anything that happened in the 12th century can't possibly matter, but of course it does. But in this case, in this case if you look at what happened in the Levant, you know, you know, Eastern Mediterranean, between the time of the Battle of Ain Jalut, which was, I think, in, oh boy, 1260-something, I could be wrong about the date. You know, again, dates, names, I'm 60. Uh, and the Mongol, the Mongol armies, um, the rescission of the Mongol armies, 1300, 1302, basically. And then in 1517, Suleiman the Magnificent comes, the Turks come, the Ottomans come, and they put their fist down on this region and they govern it. What, what, was the, what did the place look like between 1301 and 1517? 
It was a goddamn mess is what it looked like. There was no government. It was chaotic. There was some rule in cities and towns, but there was no region-wide government. There was brigandage. It was, it was total chaos. Right? If you want to get an idea, it's of course not the same as the, you know, the 14th century, but if you want to get some idea of what this part of the world might look like a little bit, go back and study the history of the Levant between 1303 and 1517, and you'll see. So I'll stop there. Sorry I spoke so long. Now, I'm prepared to stay as long as you want to, uh, if, to ask questions. It's up to you. Um, where's the mic? Okay, who has a, a question? Hi. <laughs> Sorry, that's loud. Um, thank you for coming. When I think of the Middle East right now, I think one of the biggest strategic interests in the Middle East for the U.S. is the stability of the EU and the refugee crisis. Yep. Um, I was wondering if you could comment a little bit on U.S. refugee policy and what we can do to kind of stabilize the refugee flow out of the region. That's a really excellent question. Um, and you win a magazine. <laughs> Say the magic word, win a duck. Anybody remember the Groucho show? Yeah, some of you I think m might remember. So that's a really excellent question. Um, uh, I started to argue in late September, early October, uh, remember the Russian so-called intervention. It really wasn't an intervention, it was a surge. Um, the Russians did the same thing in Syria that we do. Uh, when, we, when we do it, we call it a surge. We were there before our surge in Iraq and we were there after. We were there before our surge in Afghanistan, we were there after. The Russians were in Syria before their surge and they were there after. Some people call it an intervention and withdrawal. I don't know, it's a rectification of names problem, but anyway. The, one of the Russian goals, the third Russian goal of the three Russian goals was to deliberately exacerbate the migration crisis. What did the Russians do? They were, they were, we, we were flying 90 sorties a month because we didn't have intelligence that would uh, enable us to avoid collateral damage. The Russians didn't have the intelligence either, but they were flying 90 sorties a day. And they ran out of smart bombs in the first three days, and they were after that, they were dropping God knows what kind of ordnance on on Syrian cities. And they were targeting bakeries, and they were targeting clinics, and they were targeting hospitals. They were deliberately trying to destroy communities, same way they did in Chechnya, same way they did before in Afghanistan. And they were deliberately trying to create basically no-go zones and to force people into either internal uh, exile or to force them across the border into Turkey. This was deliberate. Why would the Russians do that? Because the Russians were trying to create leverage, they were trying, two reasons. They were trying to create leverage over the Europeans to get them to come off the Ukraine sanctions. And they were trying to embitter European politics and turn them to the right. Because those, the rightist politicians, especially in East Central Europe, like Viktor Orban, uh, best example, but also the new government in Poland, which is a great mystery how that happened. Uh, I mean, I, it's not, I'm being facetious. I know how it happened, but it's just amazing. Uh, and in Slovakia, where they actually elected real Nazis to the parliament two, a month and a half ago. The, and not to mention what goes on in France with Marine Le Pen. Uh, you know, and all throughout Europe, you have these, these nativist right-wing parties. The Kremlin loves that. Putin loves that. Because that makes it very hard for NATO to act in concert to do anything. Uh, it's very dangerous, too, because if, if, um, if the Russians can, can suborn the government in Kiev, they can walk to uh, the borders of NATO countries in, the, in Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. They can walk there rather than fight there. And then they can send the little green men and, and basically th um, uh, challenge NATO to defend uh, uh, an, an alliance member with an Article 5 guarantee. How do you do that in the, Bal in the Baltics? Guess what, you can't. So you either, you either threaten to start a nuclear war over, over, over Latvia, or uh, NATO can't defend its members, which means the end of NATO and the, the, the end of the American security system. That's not good, I think. <laughs> that's not good. So that's the game the Russians are playing here with, uh, and, and again, exacerbating the migratory pr uh, pr um, problem, uh, it was, I think, deliberate. Now they backed off of it after a while, because the Europeans fi figured it out. They were getting pretty angry, the Germans in particular. Uh, and, you know, it was time for a charm offensive. Time for uh, rhetoric like the Americans and the Russians are joining together against terrorism in the Levant, that kind of thing, right? But the, the, uh, the migratory crisis is extremely serious. People don't understand how much trouble the EU is in. Coming on the tails of the currency crisis and the, 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 the fiscal crisis, uh, it's a very, very fragile read, what's left. 
uh, of the EU. We are just one or we are just two. My my colleague Ann Applebaum, who is a member of the board of the magazine, uh, wrote uh, an op-ed recently in which we're just three we're just three unfortunate elections away from the end of NATO and the end of the EU. If if somebody like Donald Trump should win election in this country, and we're only one we're only one domestic terrorist attack from from that being a possibility, if it's if the timing is right, if Marine Le Pen wins an election in France, okay. You could just, you can see, and of course we already, we already have uh, Andrzej Duda and Kaczynski in Poland. You can just see, um, uh, and if Ms. Merkel is uh, turned out of office, you can see the end of the, end of, uh, the, the two premier Western institutions that embody value, our values basically going into, into Trotsky's dustbin. This is extremely, extremely serious. It's like, you know, the old phrase in the, from the South, you don't miss your water until your well goes dry. With no NATO and no EU, oh my God, uh, people, can't even imagine how nasty and ugly the world's going to look if that's the case. All right. So this is an extremely serious problem. What can we do about it? Well, one thing the Obama administration has um, was remarkable about for all but the last year or two, year, was failing to see European security, failing to see European integration uh, as a security issue. It's the first administration since Harry Truman who didn't understand that the the uh, um, the vicissitudes of European integration was a, of, of a security interest to the United States. I mean, Obama, you know, it seemed like he couldn't find Europe on a map. I mean, he doesn't have, he doesn't have a lot of warmth for NATO. That's, he cares about Asia. He's not in the tradition of, you know, the Atchison um, uh, kind of foreign policy. He's a, he's a younger guy and he, he doesn't, you know, it, it, the, the, Ber the Berlin blockade of 1940, those things don't make shivers go up his spine. He doesn't care about that stuff. He has no warmth, warmth for Europe, really. Uh, but it's a tremendous mistake to fail to see. I mean, we check the box. Europe is, is, is whole and free, right? We check the box. Well, it's not, boxes don't stay checked in world politics. They, they get unchecked sometimes. And, and it, I think one of the biggest mistakes of the Obama administration was taking, taking what's going on in Europe too lightly. Now, in the past couple of months, year, they've started to, the administration's changed its, its tune. And I ascribe the change mostly to Ashton Carter becoming Secretary of Defense. Ash Carter's done a lot of good, right? Uh, so we've, we've quadrupled the, the budget for stationing expeditionary forces in Europe. We're bolstering the NATO line. All those things are unfortunately necessary so the Russians aren't tempted to do something very foolish and accident prone. Uh, but it's, a little, it's too little too late. Europe is back in play and not just Ukraine. So that's unfortunate. So that's a good question, and um, we could be here again until the weekend in just talking about specifics of policy, but it's a very good question because pe I mean, people tend to think that you know, what's going on in Syria is not related to what's going on in Ukraine. That's not true. In the Russian way of thinking, they're very closely related, and they play off one another. And in fact, theaters, theaters of conflict, whether they're theaters of war or just theaters of competition, are always linked in great power diplomacy. They're not separate. And when you treat them separately, you make a big mistake. Other question? <clears throat> How you doing? Um, <clears throat> you joked earlier about uh, your PhD and your ability to like predict things. Um, <laughs> it was a joke. Yeah. yeah. No, no, no. I know it was a joke. <laughs> and uh, you also said that the next president uh, has to expect the unexpected. Um, so is the was the rise of ISIS unexpected, or did you expect that? Well, that's a good question. You guys are asking really good questions. See, Bowdoin is really living up to its reputation. Um, how shall I? How can I explain this? God forbid. God forbid. Someone you love is diagnosed with cancer, some kind of very terrible cancer, and hasva uh, halila. This should ever happen to you. You know. Pardon my Greek. Um, and eventually that person, let's say that person passes away. Are you surprised or not? You are, but you're not. I mean, with the cancer situation, you, you go through stages of mourning before the person actually dies. But you're still surprised. You're still shocked. So it's not an either or proposition. Uh, when, it came to, when it came to Daesh, uh, ISIS, um, sure, we had no phase four. We created a vacuum in, in uh, the Sunni parts of Iraq. And a lot of us said, this is going to be a, what the intelligence community calls a gray zone. 
Um, it can be a place for terrorists to plot and to um, um, train. <clears throat> so yeah. Uh, but nobody predicted at that point the Syrian civil war and how the border between Syria and Iraq would be essentially erased. And there are people, the people on either side of the border, the border are cousins. They, they're the same tribal confederations, the Ashawa tribe, a few others, right? I don't think anybody, you know, if maybe Ambassador Ford predicted that, but I don't know. I, I, don't, I didn't predict that. Um, and then, the, again, the rapid, the, the rapid removal of American forces from Iraq and the passivity with respect to Syria, whether justified or not, those three, those three things happening in Syriatum, okay? Um, you know, it's, it's, people say that retrospect is 2020. Hindsight, I mean, hindsight is 2020. That isn't true, you know. If hindsight were really 2020, then doing archival history would be easy, and it isn't. <laughs> but, but, you know, when you look back now, you can see the pieces fitting together. Did anyone, did anyone foresee that in, I don't know, 2009, 2008? I don't think so. It's a little like, you know, but it's, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a kind of journalist, I won't again say a bad word, a kind of journalist who uh, likes to say that it was actually the, it was a big new Brzezinski himself, with whom I spoke on the telephone this afternoon in a bar, believe it or not. The world is a strange place. It was a big new Brzezinski himself by, by persuading President Carter to support the Mujahideen against the Red Army that created 911. It caused 911. The, the blowback, it's called the blowback theory, 911. I call this the Immaculate Conception Theory of Foreign Policy. Okay, this, this, this policy of supporting the Mujahideen started in 1980. In 1980, nobody had ever heard of Osama bin Laden. As late as 1996, Osama bin Laden wasn't in Afghanistan, he was in Sudan. Uh, the Mujahideen that fought the Red Army are not the same people uh, who were involved in Al Qaeda except one or two of the elders. Most of them were, they were educated in Peshawar, in radical madrasas, but they weren't the same people. Nobody could have foreseen in 1980 or 1981, when the Reagan administration continued the program, nobody could, could have foreseen all, the, all these things that, that, that had to line up in order to, produ to produce uh, 911. I mean, I, th I, think these, I think these kinds of accusations are just, are ludicrous. I mean, they, they, put the, they put the decision maker who's under the pressure of the day is working with, uh, you know, incomplete information and a bureaucratic morass into the position of some kind of om omniscient genius. There's no such person in Washington, believe me. <laughs> so, you know, what you can predict, uh, it's not easy to predict these things. So I was being facetious when I said, P. I can predict some things, some things, uh, but I can't predict everything and nobody can as far as I can. Far, I don't know anybody who can predict everything. I can, what, I can, what I can predict, though, is that this stuff goes on for 15, 20 years. There'll be full employment for diplomats and pundits. That I can predict. <laughs> other, other question? I know you mentioned that there were... Um, Where are you? Oh, I'm up here. Sorry. Uh. Uh, other way. <laughs> oh, I know you mentioned that um, there are some things that the U.S. could do. You said never to fix the crisis in the Middle East, but to do um, some damage control or at least yeah. a few steps forward. And depending on who gets elected, or I mean independent of who gets elected, what are some things that you think we could do? Well, first of all, um, right now, uh, Jordan is suffering from uh, uh, a superabundance of refugees. There are lots and lots of Syrian refugees in Jordan. There are refugees, over 110,000 refugees left over from Iraq from before. Jordan is a small country you know, four and a half million people. And uh, people don't, a lot of people don't understand how important, how strategically important Jordan is. Uh, Jordan was created uh, in 1921 by Winston Churchill to be a buffer, both east-west and north-south. A buffer between Iraq and Palestine and a buffer between Syria and Saudi Arabia. Uh, if Jordan should disappear, uh, the whole configuration of power vectors changes in that region and changes for the worse. Uh, everybody, everybody suffers. Also, for at least 30 years, the largest CIA station in the Middle East has been in Jordan. Jordan Jordanian Mohabarat, Jordanian uh, uh, counterintelligence, I mean, counter, counterterrorism intelligence, very, very close allies of the United States. Yes, mistakes have been made from time to time, but basically there are, they and the Emiratis are our best allies when it comes to stuff that doesn't make the newspaper. So uh, we have not done enough to support the Jordanians. We have not done enough to shore them up uh, financially and otherwise. That's an urgent matter. We need to do that. Uh, I would, uh, 
There have been gadflies also in the Arab world <clears throat> uh, who have made things worse while, while, while petting us on the back and pretending to be nice to us. Uh, I mentioned the Qataris, all right? Um, the Alfanis in Qatar are a royal pain in the you know where, okay? We have a huge air base there, al Odaid air base. It's not just an air base, it's an air control uh, system. From el we can direct fire just about any, all the way out to Afghanistan, okay? We need the base in the region, I think, but we don't need it to be in Qatar. I'd much rather put it in Oman or in, in the UAE. Um, because, what, because the Qataris basically ex extort us. They basically, look, we have your base. Therefore, we have, we have leave to you know, give money to the Muslim Brotherhood and look the other way when our, when our rich sheikhs give money to ISIS. That's got to stop, okay? Um, Saudi Arabia, I mean, look, I mentioned Saudi Arabia in brief before. Uh, there are a lot of people who are really angry at the Saudis because they have perpetrated the kind of Islam that has led willy-nilly to the Salafi mil militancy that we, we see in Al-Qaeda and in ISIS. And all that's true, you know. But we don't have a better option right now. When people say nothing could be worse than the Al-Saud in Saudi Arabia, then they don't have the, the tragic imagination of a temperamental conservative. Things could be a lot worse. <laughs> Uh, those who think that a bunch of uh, Western liberals are, are waiting in the wings to take over the government in Riyadh are smoking something funny. That's just not the way. Uh, we're much more likely, if the, if the al Saud were to fall, we're much more likely to see a government in Riyadh that looks a lot like ISIS or al-Qaeda. So, um, so, you know, bashing the Saudis may be fun, fun but, it's, but it's, it's not a good idea right now. That said, there, there is progress being made in Saudi Arabia. Uh, they are not funding this stuff. <clears throat> they, they talk about anti-terrorism. You should see their propaganda. It's the same thing every morning when I read it. You know, it's so boring. My God, they're terrible. You know, they could use me as a writer. But, uh, but, they, but there has been some progress on shutting down these radical madrasas and on funding, funding the bad guys. There's been some progress. It needs to be faster. We need to press them more. Now, they have a problem because the Saudi regime is a biumvirate between the al-Saud and the al-Wahhab. Al uh, it's been that way since the 1700s when, when this connection came together. So when Americans go to the Saudis and they say, you know, reform your country, get rid of the religious police, for, ex for example. They really can't do that because, you know, the, the, the al-Wahhab and the al-Sad are joined at the hip. That's the way that, that's part of the constituency of the country. But we can still press them more and they can still make more progress and we haven't been doing that. Bahrain, there's a Sunni government in Bahrain, the al-Khalifa, they're awful people. Uh, they, send out, they send out thugs to beat up nurses who are, who are uh, tending to, uh, uh, to demonstra she had demonstrators who've been knocked senseless by the, by the cops, right? They're terrible people. Um, we base the Fifth Fleet in Bahrain, right? Uh, we put there in the Carter administration. It's been there ever since. The Cold War is over. There's not a damn thing that fleet can do uh, in Bahrain that we can't do, militarily speaking, given new technology from over the horizon. We could, we, could re, we could refurbish Diego Garcia again. We could do this from on ship. There are lots of ways we could perform these military functions. And we wouldn't be hostage to the Al Khalifa, which is toxic throughout the region. Okay? So there are a lot of things we could do um, just to rearrange our priorities in the Middle East and the Arab world. I mean, I would like to double down on some, some countries that are really important to us, like the Emiratis and Egypt. But I would like to stop doing a lot of counterproductive things that we do in other parts of the, of, of the region. I haven't even mentioned Morocco or Algeria. You know, there's a lot of, I mean, I, I could give you a list that's 25 pages long of little things that we could do that would add up to some significant alterations of, of the policy. But again, we'd be here until Friday. You don't want to do that. One more? Yeah, I think we'll be doing one more question. That's all right. Yes, uh, back to uh, Russia. I, uh, I've been a little bit puzzled by the uh, demonization of Putin by both the left and the right. And I've been reading various articles by uh, Russia scholars, including uh, Stephen Cohen, professor at Princeton, who writes for The Nation, a man on the left, perhaps. Yes. Regardless of whether on the left or the right, the argument goes, we shouldn't be demonizing him. Maybe we can't be friends with him, but how about allies? We could work together. This idea that he's out to take over, uh, you know, attack the West. Why don't we see him as an ally? And I sense from your comments that you would actually see Putin as much more dangerous than Professor Cohen or I do. Could you elaborate on that? Explain why we have demonized Putin. Well, it's he's so he's so telegenic. 
Uh, you know, he makes good caricature. It's easy to demonize him. Um, uh, but I, I agree with you. I mean, we, we, had, we cooperate with the Russians in areas where our interests overlap, and President Obama has done that, and we continue to do that. Our interests overlap for a time um, early on in this administration in Afghanistan. Our interests overlap in, in the P5 plus 1 negotiations, where the Russians don't want to see an Iranian proliferation any more than we do. But, <clears throat> um, and I don't think, I don't think the president... The president's rhetoric has demonized Putin. I think he's been kind of soft on Putin. He's not been trying not to make a bad situation worse. But the understanding among the people who know Russia, and on our board we have a woman named Lilia Shevtsova, who's our Russia um, person. You should read maybe some of the things that she has said about this. Also a Russian who uh, writes for us uh, often, Slava Inozemsev, Moscow State University. Um, uh, Putin needs... The enemy of the the, the enemyization is that a word of the United States and the West, in, and he needs the occasional foreign adventure in order to maintain his popularity at home because the Russian economy is circling the drain. Uh, what what some people what people have argued, and I I concur with this, is that he is trying to deliberately isolate Russia because he thinks that. If he doesn't, the insidious ideas of Western liberalism, either as constituted by the European Union or by uh, NATO or other countries, will, will make their, their way to Moscow, where in the winter of 2012-13, don't forget, there were massive demonstrations against, against Putin. So he uses the, the, um, the anti-Western rhetoric and the anti-Western body language as essentially tenure prote protection, regime protection. And he makes all sorts of outrageous, outrageous comments for that purpose. But for example, just the other day, he said that the leak of the Panama Papers, all about you know, the Shell Corporations, was an American plot to embarrass him because of all the oligarchs in Russia, you know, calling them out and showing them where their offshore bank accounts, where all the stolen money um, has been put. Now, you know, <laughs> the, the United States government did not create the leak of the Panama, the Panama Papers, I can assure you. A lot of people in Washington are just as embarrassed as a lot of people in Moscow. But Putin makes that claim. He knows it isn't true, but it plays very nicely in Russian domestic, uh, the Russian domestic environment. So, you know, I, I, uh, uh, but he has created uh, a, a very deft diplomacy from a weak hand in connecting the Ukraine and, and Syria theaters. And he has let, I mean, I, I, uh, the, 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 the head of CENTCOM is a guy named Austin, General Austin. <clears throat> Back in September, he was, or October, he was hauled before a, a committee, a, a congressional committee, and some senator asked him, what do you think the Russians are up to in, uh, in Syria, you know, with the so-called intervention? And General Austin said, uh, we, are, we, meaning the Joint Chiefs and, uh, and CENTCOM people, we are completely flummoxed. That's a direct quote, right? Putin loves to hear stuff like that. I mean, I don't know why General Austin said that. Even if, he, even if it was true, he shouldn't have said it. But Putin plays us for domestic political reasons. Do I think, the reason, the reason I, I worry about him is because I'm worried that he will, um, do, he will step over a line that will force the United States or somebody to react in a way that is in the wrong place, in the wrong time, and in the wrong manner. Now, I, I raised this before. My, an old boss of mine used to say, back in Soviet times, that the Soviets were like a cat burglar in a hotel. They'd make their way onto a floor of the hotel and they'd go trying all the doors, okay? And when they find one that isn't locked, they'd go in. The, the meaning being that, you know, unless you show some resistance, they're gonna keep on pushing incrementally to see what they can get out of you. It's like a game, right? Uh, and the danger is, is that they're, they're gonna push too far and they're gonna, they're gonna evoke a surprising reaction that's gonna turn into a conflagration that nobody wants. So he's hit the danger that he poses is not, Russia's too weak right now to actually do these things, to do anything bad to us without our help, <laughs> right? But the danger is, a, is the danger of miscalculation. So I don't, I don't think he's a demon, but I think he's a dangerous character because he could miscalculate and cause a very nasty, uh, very nasty accident. So when Stephen Cohen says it's, it's American, he's pushing NATO up against the border. Look, Look, 
Well, Stephen, Stephen Cohen has been making excuses for whatever goes on in Moscow now for 40 years, so that doesn't surprise me, okay? Uh, but it, I, I, would agree with, I would agree with the following. Um, I do think that NATO expansion was a colossal mistake, and I wrote at the time that it was a stupid thing to do. I don't, however, think that it explains Russian behavior. I mean, I would make a direct causal argument between, and John Mearsheimer has made the same case um, as Cohen uh, from, the, from the right. Well, from the, from, not, from or not the nation, but somewhere else. Um, I would make a strong case. I mean, you don't have to teach a, a snake how to suck eggs, right? So the Russians were going to do some of these things anyway if they had an opportunity. So I don't think NATO expansion directly caused it, but it was a factor and certainly made it a lot easier to, to, uh, to sell these kinds of policies domestically in Russia. Um, I think it was a colossal mistake. Um, people disagree. You know, this is, a, again, an argument around and around the block arguments since the, since the mid-1990s that, that will never end probably. But I think NATO expansion was a mistake. Uh, but I don't, I don't think it's directly, directly responsible for, for all the Russian foreign policy behavior that we've seen since. L life isn't that simple. <clears throat> we done? Thank you very much.